Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. See? I told you guys I just needed, you know, some rest, and I'd be fine today. My voice is about 95% back, so no more worries. Speaking of, thank each and every one of you that sent me some sort of get well soon comment. Thank you all so much. I do read the comments. I may not answer right away, but I'm reading, and then I answer everything when I get in the studio because my keyboard is faster than the phone. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, if you are new here, or you have been here and haven't done so already, do yourself and myself a favor, if you don't mind, hit that little subscribe button, and maybe that bell over there. Make sure that's set to all so you know every time I upload a story. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I was about five or six years of age when my nan had a party in the local pub in town opposite the local bus station. When the party ended, we went to the bus station, me, my mom, and her sister. There was this weird old man already at the station. He looked very creepy. I remember vividly his face and facial expressions and the dirty brown coat he was wearing and his disgusting smile. First, he seemed like a normal old man making conversation, although creepy looking, but he started trying to touch my mom and grabbing me. I remember running around and hiding behind my mom's legs to stop him from touching me or grabbing me. We got on the bus, shaken up, and sat at the back of the bus, and for whatever reason, the man didn't get on our bus. Not sure if it was full or he just decided not to. He got on the next bus that came along, and the two buses were driving in convoy the whole route and he just stood at the front of the bus by the driver, staring into our souls. We got off the bus, and my auntie ran with me in her arms, all the way back home with my mom, closely following. I am not sure if he got off his bus or what happened after. I have questioned and questioned my auntie and my mother because I thought I imagined it. I often wonder what his intentions were, if he wanted to just scare us or if he had a more sinister plan, but I guess we will never know. Before I get started, I spoke with my husband and another coworker. They both have different opinions. I started working at my job a few months ago and up until recently, I hadn't seen this coworker, who we will call Twinkle Toes. He walks on his toes, by the way. Turns out, he was asked to work from home for the first few months I have been there, so he just came back to the office full time. He started to walk by my desk twice a day, which is nowhere near his. As he walks by, he stares at me like Hannibal Lecter would, and makes an occasional remark about me like, burning the midnight oil, huh? And the like. The staring is so unnerving, my red flag went up and I had never even met him officially as of yet. I didn't know his name until way later after someone else told me who he was. Last week, Twinkle Toes finally approached the desk while my coworker, who we will call Amber, was there having a conversation with me. She and I share a workspace, and he went over to her side to be a part of the conversation with us. But he stared at me the entire time, never looking away, even when she spoke directly to him, and he answered. Before I left, I made it very clear that I am married and said, 
well, I'm going home to my sick husband, and we'll make him some of that soup we talked about. Then I walked out. Amber texted me shortly after. Twinkletoes just asked if he were single. She also mentioned in the text he's never stopped to talk to her in the two years they've worked there. I brushed the text off as him, you know, spacing out, but the following week he walked past a staring several times, and no one from his department does this. I also left a few minutes earlier than normal that day, and as I headed down out, he was in the middle of my path with no one else around and just stared at me as I walked towards him. I said hi and waved. He said nothing back and wasn't moving out of the way. So before I ran into him, I turned to go back into the office. I waited a few minutes, then left through a different exit and took the long way to my car, looking over my shoulder to make sure he wasn't following me. The next day was different, and I moved even further away to assist other employees temporarily. Twinkle Toes came to where I was and talked to the employees at my desk while staring at me as I walked around. I said hi and waved. He wanted to be nice to the quiet kids just in case. But he just stared. When he finally left, the other employees say he's never been to their area to talk and they assumed he was there just to watch me. I totally freaked out and asked my supervisor what to do. Apparently, he has a history of fixating on women and going too far on the awkward scale with them, but he has never done anything to physically harm anyone. I also go on a walk around our property for my lunch, and everyone in the office I work closely with knows this. He mentioned to the other employees at the different desk that he will go on a walk around the time he thinks I take my lunches. She told me if I see him out there to not let him catch up to me. I spoke with my manager and requested security escort me or watch me go to my car. My manager said they will have a discussion with him, but in the meantime, I need to leave earlier and ask if Amber can go with me out to my car, but gave me the number for security just in case. I told my husband, and he thinks I'm making the right call with security but I might need to be more aggressive toward Twinkle Toes at work. My coworkers think I need to be nice to him to keep it from getting worse. I've never had a conversation with this guy. I don't know anything about him except his tendency to stare, be in parts of the building where I am that are totally out of his way and ignore everything I say. Part of me thinks he's just really harmless, socially awkward, and doesn't know how to handle his emotions. But he stares like he wants to do something evil and doesn't respond when I talk to him directly, which is so unnerving. How can I de-escalate this situation? I love my job and don't want to feel uneasy about where I am for eight hours of the day. And I don't want to be a nuisance for security or other employees either. A quick update. After all this happened and I spoke to my manager again, he stopped coming to my desk and following me to other areas and has also stopped the staring if and when I run into him elsewhere. He is on the spectrum, as I have now found out, and the company is trying to work with him on his behavior issues. I don't think I was overreacting because I didn't know him at all before, but now I have even more information, and it seems he has moved on. I wished I didn't feel uncomfortable around him because I think outside of his fixation on me that he is a real nice person and means well. I am taking the advice to be the more assertive and standoffish one, so I don't encourage anything inappropriate. And if he does walk past me, I just don't wave or say hi. I got my first apartment about a year ago. When I moved in, I was nervous, but excited about the opportunity. 
a few weeks after moving in, I bought a puppy so I wouldn't feel so lonely. My key broke in my door, so I had to call maintenance to come fix it and let me back into my apartment. The maintenance man was instantly obsessed with my dog, but my dog was immediately afraid of him. I passed it off as nothing, since she was a puppy, and figured she might act that way around everyone new. A few weeks later, my dishwasher broke, so I had to call maintenance to come out again. I was working on crate training my dog, so I stated it was fine for them to come out while I was at work since she would be in her crate, and at most might annoy them with the mild barking. Upon arriving home from work, I found several places on my carpet where my dog had an accident. I thought I must have missed it before I left for work. I took her outside to go for a walk, and the maintenance guy stopped me and informed me he let my dog out while working on my dishwasher. He also informed me that I was starving her by keeping her locked up all day and that I wasn't a good pet owner. He then stated he could take better care of her. I was too shocked to say anything. I talked to my dog's vet, and the vet confirmed I was doing everything right for crate training my puppy. For several weeks after this, the maintenance guy would always stop to attempt to pet my dog when he saw us. I started taking different routes for walks and began driving to a nearby park just to avoid him. This was when I realized my dog didn't react to any other stranger the way she acted towards him, hiding behind me and aggressively barking. He also began making comments about my appearance. I mentioned the occurrences to my parents when they visited. My mom thought I just might be overreacting to living alone for the first time. She walked my dog with me around the complex. The maintenance guy stopped again and proceeded to make a joke about stealing my dog. We got back from the walk and my mom stated we were going out to buy video cameras for the apartment. After that, things seemed to calm down. When I had maintenance issues, a different guy would come out. My dog would still be uneasy, but wouldn't react as aggressively. Today, I had a maintenance issue yet again, and the original maintenance guy came out. My dog again reacted very aggressively. I held her to keep her calm, and she began to relax, but still remained on high alert. The maintenance guy mentioned that he noticed my family had recently visited and then proceeded to ask if they had left. He then started asking me if I was in school or working. I responded by saying I was working. He then asked how much money I make. I began feeling extremely uncomfortable and laughed off his question by stating I didn't remember. He wouldn't accept this answer and kept pestering me. I responded by saying I was bad with numbers. I'm an accountant. He then kept pestering me about how many hours I work, etc. My dog then began barking aggressively at him until he left. I honestly feel so creeped out right now. My lease is almost up. I'm moving to a different complex with a different management company. So I'm not sure if I should complain and risk them retaliating by withholding my security deposit. I'm also nervous about filing a complaint and then living here for a few more weeks. So, to the story. This happened to me about two to three weeks ago. When I was 16, I used to work at a fast food restaurant, and I live in a place where we have all four seasons. At this point in time, it was winter, so it got dark pretty early, around like 5 to 6 p.m. I was called to come into work this particular day, but the weather was kind of bad, causing us not to have any customers. As a result, we had to close the store early. It was about 5.30 p.m. when my manager left, locking the store and making me wait outside for my ride. About 20 minutes had passed since she left, and I was extremely cold. So I decided, regrettably, 
that I would walk to a friend's house just a few blocks away, about a 10 minute walk and wait for my ride there. The store I worked at was on a busy street that was near a residential neighborhood. As I walked away from the store, I started walking down the residential street behind the store. I was walking on the sidewalk to the left of the street, as there is only one sidewalk on the right side of the street. If I walked on the right sidewalk, I'd only walk on it for about a block. Then I'd have to walk the rest of it on the road. There were also woods on that side of the road. It was convenient as well because on the left side of the street was my store and there were no street lights. I walked about three fourths of the block when I got this feeling that I was being watched. The block was long, making it about the equivalent of two blocks. The neighborhood was really dark and at this point I had pretty much reached the end of my block and was getting ready to cross the street when I noticed a silhouette of someone walking on the right side of the road near the woods, about five foot nine to five foot 10, looked to be maybe 180 to 200 pounds. I couldn't make out any features though. I'm the type of person who's very aware of their surroundings and slightly paranoid as I've been followed, almost kidnapped, stalked, etc. You get the gist. So when I noticed him, I stopped walking and immediately got a sick feeling in my stomach. The man then noticed me and proceeded to walk slowly and yell out to me. He says, yo, come here, I wanna talk to you. I say back, uh, no, I'm good, I'm only 16. Then I turned around and started walking back to my store. He continues to yell things at me, trying to convince me to come to him. At that point, something in me told me to run, and I did just that. As I'm running, I know I shouldn't have, but I turned my head to see if he was actually chasing me. And to my horror, he was. So I turned up the speed and ran as fast as I could. Thankfully, as I reached the store, my ride had pulled up, so I ran to the car. As I tried to get in, the door was locked. It took about 20 seconds for them to unlock the door, which felt like hours. But eventually, I got in and just broke down crying. I'm not gonna lie. I'm kinda out of shape, so my back was hurting from breathing so hard, and I was all frazzled. This was the first time I was chased on foot, and let me tell you, it's so much more scary, surreal, and intense being chased on foot than someone chasing you by car. Still to this day, I have added trauma from this incident, and it makes it hard to go anywhere by myself, especially in the dark. So, to the man that chased after me in the dark, thank you for that trauma that I didn't need. I hope we don't cross paths anymore. Hello everyone. I've been thinking about sharing this experience for a while now, but never knew when the right time was or if it's even worth telling. I think on the surface of it, it's probably not that creepy, but it was the first time in my life where I got that, oh, this doesn't feel right, feeling in my gut. I was about five years old when this happened and I'm 31 now, but remember it clear as day. For some background, I lived at the time in a small cul-de-sac in England. At the end of our road was a row of shops and often people would park at the end of the road where there was no parking outside the shops. There was a row of terraced houses with a patch of grass outside. And on this grass, there was a small wall that had a sign on it just saying that it was private parking beyond that point. This day, a friend and I, both five-year-old girls, were sat on this wall facing the end of the road, just chatting and people watching. While we were sat there, a red car pulls at the end of the road on the right-hand side, probably about 10 meters or so away. A man then gets out of the car. He's slightly older than middle age from what I can remember. 
Immediately, and I mean the second, he gets out of the car. Before he even takes a single step, he gets out a camera and takes a photo of us sitting on the wall. Now, this is the late 90s, so this is just a disposable camera. After that, he starts walking across the street, and as he gets halfway across the street, he stops, takes another photo of us, and then keeps going. As soon as he gets to the pavement on the other side of the road, he again stops and takes yet another photo. Then, he continues walking in the direction of the shops. I remember asking my friend what was he doing, but I can't really remember anything else about what we said. I think we just shrugged it off and kept talking about whatever it was we were talking about before. A little while goes by and the man returns, and then he does it again. He stops on the pavement right before crossing the road and takes a photo of us keeps walking, gets halfway across the road, and takes another photo of us, keeps walking, and then takes a final photo of us right before he gets in his car. At no point during any of this interaction does he say a single word to us. He never asks to take our photo, says hello, waves, smiles. Nothing. Just completely silent and straight-faced and taking photos. At this point, I think we both get this bad feeling. I for sure do, and run inside to tell our parents. I didn't even know what it was that I was feeling being so young. I just knew that this didn't feel good, and my gut was screaming at me that I needed to tell someone about this. I half expected my parents to tell us that we were being silly, but they looked shocked and immediately called the police. I remember the police coming and us telling them this story, and they looked concerned, which again, I didn't expect. I knew it felt wrong, but I also thought that because he just left and didn't do anything, and it wasn't illegal to take photos, that we would be told off, making a fuss of it. Again, I was only five, so even though I felt it to be weird, I just didn't know why. I remember the police leaving and saying that they would keep us updated, but I don't remember anything happening after that. Which isn't that surprising. I'm sure our description of the man wasn't that good and we didn't know about getting number plates or anything of the sort. I have thought of this incident on and off throughout my life as a weird thing that happened. Of course, now, as an adult, I understand more why it was really weird that this man was taking photos of really young girls than I back then. Still, I try and rationalize it in my brain. Is it really that creepy? Maybe he just thought it was a nice image. Two girls hanging out in the middle of summer. But even writing that, it feels weird. But of course, Nothing actually ever happened to us. I never saw that man again. We weren't kidnapped or worse. So maybe it was innocent? What makes it hard for me to consider it as a slightly weird but innocent encounter is the fact he never spoke or even acknowledged us. I think it would be super weird anyway for a random man to ask to take a picture of two little girls but the fact he didn't say anything at all was just weird. Also, I find it so weird that he didn't just take one photo. He took six, like he was trying to get the perfect shot. It's weird to me that I have no idea what happened to those photos. I'd love your opinion on this. Is it creepy or am I just over-exaggerating the situation? Like I said, it ended up perfectly fine Nobody got hurt. Why do you think this man took the photos? It's the first time I've shared this story outside my family and friends, but it still sticks with me to this day. This is a memory of mine when I was about 10 years old. I was home alone with my little brother, who was seven at the time. We lived in a large house in a nice neighborhood. We are from Northern Eastern Europe. 
I want to say first that our parents were not home. It was pretty usual that sometimes we would be home alone until midnight, and we enjoyed that we could be awake for so long. And in our living area, I had never seen anything unusual or scammers. And after this encounter, I'm 22 years old today, I haven't seen anything else like that. In my country, it's actually very odd to even see any scammers or people asking for money from strangers. Anyway, I remember it was a cold winter night, and when you looked outside of the window, you could easily see your reflection that dark. We were chilling with my brother playing PlayStation when suddenly I did hear that someone did come onto our front porch. I immediately just thought that it was our parents and that they were getting home early, but no one tried to come in. I was so scared, but I did open the door and she started to show me some papers with texts saying something that she can't speak anything and she needs money for some surgery. She was carrying some old frames with her that she wanted to sell. I told her I didn't have any money and my parents were not home. Right in that moment that I said that, my heart dropped because she now knows we are alone. She insisted money and showed those papers to me over and over. She got closer and I got a feeling that she was trying to get in. This happened sometime in January, and the only money I did have was a $100 bill my dad gave me on Christmas. I was so scared, I gave away my bill, what I had been asking from my dad. The woman smiled at me and left. I started crying when I checked the streets from our windows, and I didn't see any car that she was driving away in. She was walking around at negative 30 degrees, I don't think so. I did run in every room in our house and locked all doors. When I started shutting windows, blinds around our house, I saw the woman in our backyard. I screamed, closed every window and called our parents. They came right away and they were furious because what kind of scammer is that ruthless and won't stop even after seeing children that are scared? The police came and they later told us the neighborhood did see a van on the streets and they tried to find it, but they didn't. We did keep our doors locked after that and our parents rarely left us alone for that long time. I have read that some people in the neighboring counties did have that scammer culture thing that they couldn't speak and ask for money, but I don't know. I'm still creeped out. I hope she didn't scare any other kids that night and hopefully use my money for something reasonable. I wanna start this off by apologizing as English is not my native tongue, so please forgive my mistakes. This happened around 2021 in India around COVID period where lockdowns were still very much effective. My dad used to live in another city. My brother was in college and my mom had a government job so she had to go to her office every day. So I was basically left alone from 10 a.m. to around 6 p.m. I think. We used to live in an apartment unit but it had two doors. One was the main door and the other one was located in the biggest bedroom, basically my parents' room. The door was clearly locked with an actual lock from the outside and it also had a metal sliding door thing, the one with the chain structure. I'm from India, so you can Google elevators to find out what I'm talking about. And it was also locked from the outside we had a ring bell on the outside, but it was just connected to a small bulb in the bedroom. So, one day at around 12 p.m., I was in my room, which was basically adjacent to my parents' room, and I felt, I don't know, weird. So, I just went to check their room. I went to the room to see the bulb blinking, i.e. someone was ringing the doorbell. 
My mom used to say ignore it because if it was someone we knew ringing, they would know the real door. I stood there for a moment when the person started really knocking hard on the door, like it was straight up rattling. But the thing was, due to the metal gate in front of it, it would be very hard to put your hand inside to knock on the actual door. Even I couldn't fit my palm into it. I was also a teen back then, so I wasn't that big. And this man was straight up banging on it. I got scared and called my mom, who told me not to panic. But I really, really was weirded out. So I locked my parents' door with the lock they had and went downstairs to chill in my brother's room. It was one of those days where my mom straight up wouldn't return until like 8 p.m. So I was alone for a long time and I was scared to even go upstairs. At around 6 p.m., our helper, Auntie, came and I was a little better by then that someone else was in the house. And during that time, I used to take private lessons and my teacher used to come by around 7.30 p.m., I think. So I felt better that I'd be having people here with me. Our main door has a big window just beside it. So whenever someone was at the door, we used to open the window to check and see who was there before opening it. But Auntie had the habit to just open it without checking. Like you memorize the timings of people so you can open because you know it'll be them kind of thing. Fortunately, that day, when the doorbell rang, she opened the window and then she came to my brother's room to tell me I had a cake delivery. Thing was, I didn't, obviously. So I went out to check through the window. There was a man with a cap hiding his face, holding a very small box. Now, a cake box is very square and big, right? Even a pound cake has a big ass box. And in India, we have a very small sweet box. So imagine 100 grams of a sweet box being called cake box. And I immediately asked him who was the delivery for. He didn't give me any name, not even of the company. Just told me it was for our flat. I called my mom and asked if she had made the delivery and she said she didn't know what I was talking about. So the dude was like, just accept the box, open the door. And by a miracle, my teacher walked up the stairs and asked what was happening. The dude saw my teacher and ran up the stairs. We lived on the first floor and we let our teacher enter. Later when my mom inquired about a delivery guy coming to our flat with our security guard. He said he wasn't there at his post for around half an hour when it happened. And we didn't have CCTVs in our building, so no one saw him. It wasn't that scary maybe, but it did shake me up and I asked my mom to at least come quickly from her office on the next day. And I didn't stay upstairs when I was home alone. Last 4th of July, my boyfriend and I went to the river with his friend's family. The river was so packed we could barely find a good spot to set up our little grill and chairs. We stayed for a few hours and had a good time. It wasn't until we were ready to leave that one of the creepiest encounters of my life happened. I don't know what else to call it besides a possible kidnapping or sex trafficking situation. For context, I live in Arizona. My boyfriend, his friend, his friend's dad, and I were outside packing up one of the cars. His friend's niece sat in the car. My boyfriend's friend's mom and his sister had driven separately and sat in their car beside us. Two men drove up and parked right next to their vehicle. It was already a bit weird that he parked right next to us because there was quite a few available parking spots. 
The man rolled down his window, and I immediately recognized a man who was smiling the biggest smile at me an hour or so earlier while we were tubing down the river. At first, I didn't think anything of it, but looking back, that smile felt so creepy. The man didn't say anything substantial. He just asked for directions or something and rolled his window back up and stayed parked next to our friend's mom and sister. We finished packing up and were about to head out. Everyone was sitting in the car at this point. Our friend's mom and sister backed up and started to leave, and the two men immediately followed after them. This few-minute time span literally has my eyes watering up. I am so afraid to think what potentially could have happened. When the two men drove off, a white van parked further back in the parking lot followed right after them. At this point, they still had not left the parking lot. My boyfriend's friend told his dad, call mom, and so he did. Everybody was taking the situation seriously. Whether or not it was a dangerous situation is impossible to tell, but I'm glad that we treated it like one. As the friend's dad called his wife, we all stepped out of the car and watched all three vehicles from across the lot. I was terrified they would drive off, especially because reception is shitty in this area. Thankfully, they picked up the phone right away. We could see them parked at the edge of the parking lot's exit, about to drive off. Our friend's dad just told them to come back. His tune was unusually serious, which only made the situation more anxiety-inducing. When they did a U-turn, so did the other two cars. But I think when the two men saw all of us outside of the car on alert, they decided to leave. Both the two men in the white van left at the same time. Apparently, while the mother and sister were parked, the two men tried to speak to them and ask for directions again or something. I don't think they knew exactly what was said either. Part of me doubts anyone would try to pull something on July 4th, probably one of the busiest days at the river, and one of the day's cops were out the most. But this is still one of the creepiest encounters of my life, and I'm hoping somebody can make more sense of it than I can. In 2019, I moved to a post-Soviet country for work. There's this American diner I always go to on Saturdays for lunch. It's a one-of-a-kind place in the city, owned by this half-Cuban dude who loves the USA. Not surprisingly, the place attracts a lot of Americans, expats, who want to feel home. It takes me around 25 minutes to get there walking from my apartment but it gets extremely cold during winter months. I always have to take a taxi that drops me off next to the big mall on the opposite side of the narrow street where the diner is. The street is inaccessible by car. It's hard to describe it, but the best way to reach the restaurant's entrance is by crossing the fence garden of an old wooden church. It's an Orthodox church from the 19th century turned into a museum it is now surrounded by massive office buildings. The garden is small, you can cross it in three minutes, and the exit gate faces the restaurant. During winter, snow covers it completely. It was a Saturday morning, January if I recall correctly, and the snow was fresh on the ground. I was walking to the diner when I noticed unusual footprints in the snow as if someone was walking in circles, back and forth and for a long period. But there was nobody around and all of the office buildings seemed to be closed. I kept walking. All of a sudden, a man that was hiding behind the church reveals himself. He doesn't look hostile, but there's something extremely odd about him. He's wearing baggy jeans, a dirty hoodie, and a blue cap. 
it was extremely cold and his outfit was not the best for the weather. He approaches me smiling. He starts walking on my side. Hey there, he says in English. Hey, where are you from? Don't be afraid, I like foreigners. The vast majority of the population there looked East Asian, so it's easy to tell I'm not a local. His English is surprisingly good. I keep walking in silence. You don't need to be afraid, my friend. I'm part of the couch surfing community. I'm a nice guy, look. He tries to show me something on his phone, maybe his couch surfing profile page. Would you stay at my place? He says. Uh, no, dude, thank you, I say. Then he says, okay, would you give me some money to buy us both coffee? You don't have to come with me. What the fuck, man? At that moment, I was already in front of the restaurant and casually opening the door to enter. He didn't follow me. Two weeks later, same Saturday routine, lunch at the diner and then back home. On my way, I decided to grab a coffee at a nearby place. As I'm walking to the shop, I feel someone following me. Yep, it's him. Again, and wearing the same clothes. We make eye contact and he starts laughing. Then he proceeds to do an extremely creepy thing. He hides behind a bus stop that has glass panels on the sides and keeps staring at me. I mean, I could still see him. He was being a complete creep on purpose. I enter the coffee shop and tell the barista, hey, uh, there's a guy following me. The girl looks at me worried and says something to the security guard. It's common to see guards in all the shops there. The guy enters the shop. The moment the door closes behind him, the barista looks at the guard who immediately removes him from the place. They were so fast, it almost seemed as if they knew him. Thankfully, I never saw that creepy guy ever again. I've really been wanting to share this story for some time now, but haven't had the courage to do so. The other people involved didn't really like talking about it. It's upsetting and doesn't make us look good. But I just think it's a great, awful story at this point. So I'm gonna tell it. I'm sorry, this is going to be a long one. Names are changed, of course, to protect personal information. About five years ago, my wife and I went on a weekend camping trip with our two closest friends, another married couple. The campsite is just outside of Yosemite and absolutely beautiful. The beauty of it, and creepiness to it, of course, is that you can take a dirt road for about an hour and a half off the main road to get to it. It's extremely secluded, but never felt threatening. It's a really popular campsite, so there were always people around, especially in the summer when this occurred. The first day was awesome. I don't remember exactly what we did, but I remember having a great time. The campsites are all fairly close together and usually separated by various shrubs, etc. I remember we were all pretty pumped about the site we got, as there was no neighbors or anyone to the sides of us, just the forest, and no one occupying the site closest to us. This is uncommon, as these campgrounds stay fully booked throughout the summer. Day two started normally. We had breakfast, then headed to the lake for a couple of hours. The lake was about a 20-minute hike from the main campground. When we got back at around two-ish, we noticed that the site next to us now had a silver rental car parked on it. We didn't think much of it and went about making a fire to cook with. At some point, we noticed the occupant of the site next to us, a pretty average looking white dude, maybe early 40s. Honestly, he was so average looking that it's hard to even picture him. 
we all immediately caught on to the fact that he was consistently looking over at us. My friend Dave even made a comment to me under his breath. You notice this guy keeps looking over here? I remember feeling a little uncomfortable as we were all still in bathing suits from the lake, but made a conscious effort to ignore it. It's worth mentioning that we were a little buzzed and drunk, not out of control or anything, just feeling pretty good. Throughout the afternoon and into the evening, we continued to notice the guy constantly looking over at us. In hindsight, Dave or I should have called him out. This story doesn't make us look great, but whatever. I had been stressed at work prior to the trip and really did not want to let some creepy dude throw off my relaxed vibe. It's stupid, I know. The alcohol coupled with the fact that we honestly kind of felt bad for him led us not to confront him. Yes, he was very creepy, but I told myself he was just an awkward, lonely dude. Aside from the staring, there were a couple of mildly weird incidents that occurred leading up to the very weird stuff. The first was that, at some point, he left the site to go do whatever. While he was gone, a girl, probably in her mid-twenties, walked by and snapped a picture of his license plate. I remember asking her if she needed anything, and she smiled awkwardly and kept walking. Dave and I both thought this was odd, but we were preoccupied with beer. Later into the evening, around 7-ish, the camp host was doing her rounds checking people in. She checked us in and moved on to him. I remember us all eavesdropping intently to hear what they were saying. I think we just wanted to hear what this creep sounded like. He kept asking questions about the bathhouse. We didn't know there was a bathhouse or even what a bathhouse was, but he had like a hundred different questions about it. Where is it? How late is it open? Is it private? Maybe not that weird, but in context, definitely odd. The sun started to go down. We were all drunk, so we weren't too concerned with creepy dude anymore. At one point, we went for a walk and noticed him snooping around what we believe to be a bathhouse. Now, I would call out this kind of behavior, but again, I was drunk and five years stupider at the time. We all laughed and talked about how creepy he was. Back at the site, we continued to drink and have a good time. At one point, the guy started eating beans aggressively out of a can in the light of his single lantern. He didn't have a fire going. He looked at us while doing it, and Dave and I kind of snickered to each other how weird it was. I don't think the girls noticed. Eventually, we decided to go to bed. I think the guy had left his sight at this point. I kind of remember us making jokes like, I better not wake up with that dude looking in our window, ha ha ha. My wife and I slept in our SUV with the seats folded down. Dave and Sarah slept in the camper shell of their truck. I remember feeling a little creeped out as I fell asleep, but shrugged it off. At around 2.30 a.m., both my wife and I were jolted awake by what we thought was a woman's scream. We both looked at each other and asked if the other had heard that. We came to the conclusion that it was probably people at some other site being loud and decided to go back to sleep. As I was trying to go back to sleep, I started feeling very unsettled. I decided to get out of the car and take a look around. I cracked my door, trying to be as quiet as possible. I'd gotten about one leg out of the car when I heard faint but direct whispering coming from Dave and Sarah's camper shell, which was about four feet away. I froze and then heard it again. I eventually realized that they were trying to tell me something. I whispered back, what? I then very clearly heard Dave say, start your car. I instantly realized that something was wrong.
So, rather than asking questions, I climbed back into my car to start it. Right away, Dave and Sarah bursted out the back of the camper and frantically jumped into my car. They told me to drive. Now. They were too freaked out to explain anything, so I just drove kind of aimlessly. Eventually, I pulled over, figuring we were far enough away from whatever had freaked them out. Finally, Sarah calmed down enough to tell us what had happened. As she put it, she was woken by a light coming from the creepy dude's campsite. Apparently, he had set up some lanterns and flashlights to spotlight himself, completely naked, masturbating in the direction of our cars. She also mentioned that he was flaccid and not able to finish. A gross detail, but I feel it's important. It gets weirder, though. At some point, he stopped and turned off the lights and began using a flashlight to signal across a small ravine that the campsite's backed up to. I'm talking like Morse code or something like that. Across the ravine, an old RV began using its headlights to signal back. Dave was awake by this point. I questioned them on this detail, and they both said it was very clear that they were communicating. After that, he turned off his light. Keep in mind, it is absolutely pitch black out there at night. After a few minutes, they heard footsteps around their car, followed by a hard tap on the window. That is what caused Sarah to scream, hence waking me up. At this point, I decided that we needed to call the police. The problem was, there was obviously zero cell service at the campsite. Furthermore, it was about an hour and a half up a service road from what was already a very remote part of the state. So, leaving at night wasn't an option. We decided the best course of action was to alert the camp host. We drove around and eventually found the trailer she lived in. She was understandably confused to be woke up at 3.30 in the morning, but she was responsive. She mentioned that the guy was really weird when she checked him in and called the police on her satellite phone. Apparently, there was massive wildfire burning that weekend, and the police said they wouldn't be able to send anyone out until sunrise. The campo said there really wasn't anything she could do beyond, you know, just calling the police. It really sucked hearing that. Basically, we were stuck in our car in the pitch blackness while some crazy masturbating dude was out and about. Not to mention, whoever was in that RV. One more really weird thing happened. At around 4 a.m., we were all still sitting in my car when a man in a hood walked right up to the window. The second I noticed him, I turned on my engine and headlight. He ran off into the trees. We all sat in my car until sunrise. Once it was light out, we went back to the site to pack up our things. His car was still there, with blankets hung in all the windows. The whole thing just felt gross, and we wanted to get the hell out of there, so we quickly packed up, and we got the hell out of there. A couple of hours after we left, I got a call from the police. They said they went out to the campsite and questioned the guy. He said he was simply showering. The cop told me there was nothing he could do. It was our word against his. He also questioned the people in the RV. They said they didn't know what he was talking about, but mentioned that, and I quote, a very rude camper screamed in the middle of the night. The whole experience with the police was frustrating. I tried following up. I even tried getting help from a family member who's the sheriff. But even he said there isn't anything that they could do unless the particular police chief really wanted to investigate the guy. So that's the story. I learned a hard lesson about being polite when someone is making you uncomfortable. Nowadays, I am much more aggressive with creepy people. 
I also know it's easy to hear this story and wonder why Dave or myself didn't just confront the guy, especially when he's literally masturbating at our car you're sleeping in. I don't know. I wish we would have showed more courage, but honestly, it was really scary in the moment. I'm okay with admitting that, because now that I think of it, it's kind of funny just how stupid we were and how bizarre the whole situation was. I also feel fortunate that no one was hurt. Clearly, we were dealing with a very fucked up individual who had accomplices. I can only imagine what their end goal was and what they would have been capable of doing. I also think that they had done shit like this before. I just really wish the police could have done something. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. I'd like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Anita V, Matt Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Tammy Slayton, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Normie DW, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank each and every one of you for continuously supporting Back to Ashes, for without you, this channel or myself would not exist. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. But in the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.